Welcome to your deep dive. Today, we're going to tackle a pretty fascinating question. Is the stock market becoming less efficient? We've got a, a really great paper here by Clifford Asnes. It's called The Less Efficient Market Hypothesis. And uh, buckle up, he's making some pretty bold claims here based on his 35 years in the game. Yeah, and those claims have some pretty big indications. You know, the idea of an efficient market, the idea that prices reflect all available information. I mean, that's pretty central to how a lot of people think about investing. Right. Efficient markets, theoretically at least, it means that money flows to the best companies. But if Asnes is right, if things are actually getting less efficient, well, that kind of changes the game. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. It certainly does. And, you know, Asnes isn't, he's not just throwing this idea out there. He's got some some compelling evidence, starting with something called the value spread. Okay, so let's unpack that value spread for those of us who don't speak finance jargon all day long. It's actually, it's pretty straightforward. Imagine you're comparing two baskets of stocks. One basket is full of companies that everyone thinks are, you know, hot stuff. High growth, the next big thing. But they're expensive relative to their earnings or their assets. And then the other basket is full of companies that are kind of unloved. Maybe they're a little bit slower growth, but they're cheap. And the value spread is basically how big the difference in valuation is between those two groups. Gotcha. So a big value spread means the market is putting a premium on those high-flying stocks, those, you know, the exciting ones. So what did Asnes find when he looked at this over time? Well, he found two periods where that value spread just exploded. The dot-com bubble of 1999-2000, no surprise there. But then it happened again around 2019-2020, and that's a pretty big red flag that suggests maybe the market was getting a little irrational. Wow, twice in about 20 years. Those are some serious market swings. But hold on, couldn't there be other reasons for this besides inefficiency? I mean, maybe those expensive stocks yeah. were just actually worth so much more. Or maybe something changed about how we value companies. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's exactly what Asnes and his team investigated. You know, they looked at whether it was just tech stocks driving the difference. They looked at whether intangible assets, things like patents, were being mispriced. They even considered the impact of low interest rates on valuations. So they did their homework. What was the verdict? Well, after ruling out all those other explanations, they concluded that what we were seeing were indeed bubbles, periods where, you know, prices just got completely detached from the underlying fundamentals of those businesses. Bubbles popping up, that's scary enough. But Asna says there's another worrying element here. It's not just how big these mispricings got, but how long they lasted. Precisely. Think about it from an investor's perspective. Yeah. Okay, so you might have a solid, rational strategy based on, you know, buying undervalued companies. But what happens when those inefficiencies persist for years, even decades? It gets really tempting to abandon ship, even if you believe in your approach. It's like watching your favorite sports team lose season after season. You mm -hmm. start to question if they'll ever, you know, turn it around. So the big question is, why is this happening? Why are markets seemingly getting less efficient? Well, Asnes proposes three main hypotheses, and they're all pretty thought-provoking. The first one might surprise you. It's the rise of indexing. Wait, indexing? That's supposed to be the sensible set-it-and-forget-it strategy for everyday investors. How could that be a problem? Well, it's a question of scale. Think about it. If a huge chunk of the market is just passively buying everything in an index, not really digging into individual company valuations, are prices truly reflecting accurate information, or are we just creating a giant self-fulfilling prophecy. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting point. It's like if everyone at a flea market just started bidding the average price for everything, regardless of whether it was a, you know, a priceless antique or a rusty old can opener, things would get pretty wonky. Okay, what's hypothesis number two? Okay, so this one's 
specifically tied to the 2019-2020 bubble. Super low interest rates for a really long time. Now, mathematically speaking, low interest rates shouldn't necessarily cause crazy stock valuation. But maybe it messes with our heads. Exactly. It's that easy money phenomenon. When borrowing is cheap, maybe it just pushes investors to take bigger risks, chase higher returns, and end up driving prices up beyond what's rational, almost like a market-wide sugar rush. Okay, so we've got indexing, we've got easy money, both potentially fueling these inefficiencies. All right, what's the final hypothesis? This is where it gets really interesting, right? This is the one that Asnes thinks is most likely the culprit. Technology, and specifically social media. We tend to think of tech as making markets more efficient, right? More info, faster trades, all that. But Asnes argues that it might be doing the opposite. Hold on, explain that one. How could technology be making things less efficient? Well, think about how social media works. It's designed to create echo chambers. To show you more what you already agree with, that can be great for connecting with like-minded people, but in the investing world, it can lead to a dangerous herd mentality. Ah, I see where you're going with this. Everyone piling into the same trendy stocks, FOMO driving decisions, instead of fundamental analysis. Is that what Asnes is saying? Exactly. He actually predicted this back in 2000, talking about how online trading can feel like video poker, where the odds are in your favor. And he quotes Warren Buffett, who said, markets are starting to behave more like casinos. Ooh, that's a chilling thought. So if all this tech is actually turning us into a coordinated, clueless mob, to use Asnes's phrase, where does that leave investors who are trying to stay rational? That's the million dollar question. Asnes has some specific advice for navigating this new landscape. And it's not all doom and gloom. In fact, he argues that if he's right, it could create even bigger opportunities for those who can keep a cool head. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. I'm ready to hear how to survive and thrive in this less efficient market. Well, thankfully, Asnes actually lays out some pretty practical advice for how to navigate this new landscape. He starts with a history lesson. History like dusting off those old textbooks about market crashes and booms. <laughs> I'm game. But what's the point here? Well, it's about understanding that market history isn't just a bunch of dates and numbers. You know, Asnes emphasizes the difference between statistical time and real lifetime. You can look at a chart and see that a certain strategy bounced back from a downturn in, say, five years. But actually living through those five years, that can feel like an eternity. Like intellectually, I know a bear market is temporary. But when your portfolio is getting hammered, time seems to slow down to a crawl. Emotionally, it's a whole different ballgame. Exactly. And that's why Asna says studying history is so important. It's about preparing yourself mentally and emotionally for the inevitable ups and downs. Because if he's right about inefficiency increasing, those swings could get wilder and last longer. So lesson one, history is our guide. Not just for what happened in the past, but for how it felt to live through it. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what other wisdom does Asnes have for us? Well, he warns against getting too caught up in recent trends, especially when it comes to valuations. He uses the example of U.S. stocks outperforming international markets for the past 30 years. Seems like a slam dunk right. But a big chunk of that outperformance is actually due to changes in how expensive U.S. stocks got. Not necessarily because the underlying businesses were that much better. So just because something has been on a hot streak doesn't mean it'll last forever. Past performance is no guarantee of future results, as they say. Precisely. And this ties into another key piece of advice. Focus on the big picture. You know, your entire portfolio. Yeah. Not just the individual winners and losers. Diversification is crucial. Because it means that even in a less efficient market where some areas might be wildly mispriced, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket makes sense. It's like having a balanced breakfast, right? You don't just want a giant bowl of sugar, even if it tastes good in the moment. That's a great analogy. And speaking of balancing things out, Asnes also wants us to rethink how we evaluate our investments mm -hmm. over those typical three to five year periods. You mean like how a lot of people judge their portfolio's performance or mm. compare different funds? Right. But Asnes says we often react to those time frames in the wrong way. Instead of chasing what's been hot for the past few years, he suggests flipping the script, look for areas that have underperformed over that time. Because at those longer horizons, there's a tendency for trends to reverse. So if everyone's piling into, say, emerging market stocks, because they've been crushing it for the past five years, maybe that's a sign to be cautious. Exactly. It's a contrarian approach. And it takes a lot of discipline, especially when everyone else seems to be getting rich on the latest fad. Okay. I'm starting to see how Asnes's advice ties back to that history lesson. 
Understanding how markets have behaved in the past can help us avoid those emotional reactions to short-term trends. Absolutely. Now, for those who are more quantitatively inclined, Asnes also talks about using tools like machine learning, adaptive models, and alternative data sources to gain an edge in a less efficient market. So like using fancy algorithms and big data to spot those inefficiencies that the average investor might miss. Exactly. It's about leveraging technology in a smart way, not just getting swept up in the hype. Gotcha. But even with the best tools and historical knowledge, sticking to a rational strategy is still tough, right? I mean, our brains aren't always wired for long-term thinking, especially when markets are going haywire. That's why Asnes emphasizes the importance of developing a truly long-term mindset. He actually calls it the closest thing to an investing superpower. It's about having the discipline to ride out the storms and not panic sell just because things are getting bumpy. He even gives a nod to the meme stock crowd, you know, those hold on for dear life folks, not no, these no. endorsing meme stocks, but uh, that idea of holding strong even when everyone else is freaking out. It's about trusting your process and remembering why you invested in the first place. So we've got history as our guide, a healthy skepticism of recent trends, a focus on the big picture, and a long-term mindset. That's a pretty solid toolkit for navigating a less efficient market. It is. And while all this talk of inefficiency and bubbles might seem a bit daunting, Asnes reminds us that there's a bigger picture here. Efficient markets aren't just about making money. They're essential for a healthy economy. Because when capital is allocated efficiently, it flows to the best ideas, the most innovative companies, the solutions that can make a real difference in the world. Exactly. So even though sticking to a rational strategy in a less efficient market can be challenging, there's a sense of satisfaction that comes from knowing you're contributing to a well-functioning system. It's almost like a social responsibility to be a smart investor, to make sure our money is going to the right places. That's a great way to think about it. And ultimately, Asnes concludes that good investing has always required a blend of analytical skill and emotional fortitude. But in this less efficient market, those qualities are even more important. So we need to sharpen our minds, strengthen our resolve, yeah. and be ready for a wild ride. Indeed. But before we wrap up, there's one more piece of the puzzle we need to explore. We heard Asnes' side of the story. But what about the counter arguments? Are there valid reasons to believe that maybe markets aren't as inefficient as he claims? Ooh, now that's a twist. I'm definitely curious to hear the other side of this debate. Right. It's important to consider the counter arguments, you know, to see if Asnes' hypothesis holds up under scrutiny. After all, the idea of efficient markets is pretty deeply ingrained in a lot of financial thinking. So let's play devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. What are some of the main critiques of Asnes' idea? Well, one of the most common pushbacks is that Asnes might be overstating the case. Some <laughs> argue that markets are still pretty darn good at processing information and reflecting it in prices, even with all the noise and craziness we see. Okay, I can see that. I mean, the market keeps going up over the long term, right? Even with those bubbles. Asnes pointed out, it seems like things eventually correct themselves. Exactly. And some argue that even if those bubbles are getting bigger or lasting longer, it's not necessarily a sign of less efficiency. Maybe it's just a different kind of efficiency at play. Interesting. So what are they saying is different now? Well, think about how much the world has changed, even just in the past few decades, technology, globalization, the rise of intangible assets like intellectual property. I mean, all these factors make valuing companies more complex than it used to be. So maybe the market is just taking longer to figure things out, process all this new information and determine what companies are truly worth. It's not necessarily being irrational, just more deliberate. That's one way to look at it. And this ties into another critique, which is that Asnes' focus on value investing might be too narrow. Ah, so maybe it's not that the market is getting less efficient, but that the old school value investing playbook isn't as effective as it used to be. That's what some people argue. They say that in today's economy where innovation and disruption are happening at warp speed, simply looking at traditional valuation metrics like price to earnings ratios might not be enough. Right, because a company with a seemingly high valuation might actually be a bargain if it's about to revolutionize an entire industry like, say, the next Tesla or Amazon. I mean, those companies probably looked expensive on paper for a long time before the market fully caught up to their potential. Precisely. And to be fair to Asnes, he does acknowledge the limitations of pure value investing. He talks about incorporating other factors like quality, profitability and growth potential into the equation. 
But even with those adjustments, some critics argue that value investing might be losing its edge in a world driven by technology and intangible assets. Okay, so we've got two main counterpoints. Maybe the market is still efficient just in a different way than we're used to, and maybe the problem isn't inefficiency itself, but that our traditional investing approaches need to evolve. So where does that leave us who's right? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And unfortunately, there's no easy answer. You know, the market is a complex, constantly evolving system. It's influenced by human behavior, technological advancements, geopolitical events. I mean, it's impossible to predict with certainty what the future holds. So it's not about picking sides, team assness versus team efficient market. Yeah. It's more about understanding that there are multiple perspectives, multiple forces at play, and we need to be open to all of them. Exactly. And that's why engaging with these debates is so valuable, even if it doesn't lead to a clear cut conclusion, it forces us to question our assumptions, to challenge our own biases and to constantly refine our understanding of how markets work. It's like that saying the only constant is change. We can't just assume that what worked in the past will keep working in the future. Couldn't agree more. And regardless of whether Asnes is right or wrong about the specific level of inefficiency his paper serves as a powerful reminder that we can't take market efficiency for granted. We need to be thoughtful, deliberate investors doing our own research, not just blindly following the herd or chasing the latest hot stock tip. And we need to be prepared for volatility for those inevitable ups and downs, knowing that Long-term success in the market is about staying the course, not trying to time every twist and turn. Well said. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the key takeaway you want our listeners to walk away with? I think it's this. Investing is a journey, not a destination. It's about constantly learning, adapting, and evolving our approach as the market changes around us. And ultimately, it's about making informed decisions that align with our goals and values. Beautifully put. Thanks for joining us on this intellectual adventure. We hope you've gained some valuable insights and feel a bit more equipped to navigate the complexities of the market, whether it's efficient, less efficient, or somewhere in between. It's been a pleasure. And to our listener, until next time, happy investing. <laughs>